What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Season 2 of the Inflow Experience Podcast. I'm your host, Tarek Sabasic, and this season we're doing things a little bit differently. Our topic for this season is going to be WEM. So uh, we thought, uh, who, who better to, to bring over than, uh, than the guru himself, uh, Dave Hookstra. Dave, thank you so much for taking the time today, my friend. How are you? Uh, thanks for having me, Tarek. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm sure there are just uh, there are, there are literally dozens of people out there salivating for a good WEM conversation. Now, uh, I, I I certainly am one of them, so I'm really looking forward to being on with you today. I'll tell you what, when we were looking for people to bring onto the pod, we wanted to make sure that we got the guy that uh, has the the slogan at the end of his email as a WEM WFM evangelist. So. Love to see that. That's a good. That's a good. Uh, you know, direction to go down immediately. So I do appreciate seeing that. Yeah, I get the question a lot. Like, what exactly is an evangelist? So hopefully, we're going to address that today. <laughs> yeah, let's dive right into it. What when you when you when you say evangelist? I mean, obviously, you know, tons of people have different definitions, but dive us a little bit deeper down to uh, what you consider. You know, yourself as you know, people say pro. People say, um, you know, expert. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so you know, it's it's a weird it's a weird position that uh, sometimes doesn't make a lot of sense and and if people get a big question mark over their head as to exactly what that means, I don't blame them at all because uh, it happens quite a bit. But it's basically my job to represent the Calabrio brand and the the Calabrio product and part of that is being really overtly passionate about this kind of stuff and and I can I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that it's not an act. Um, you know, I kind of got my start in this back in the late 90s uh, doing a call center uh, agent, right? I was I was an agent for a pager company, if that gives you any idea how long ago that was. Uh, some of your audience may even go, wait, what is he even talking about? There are these little squares we wore on our hip that, that buzzed when someone called a phone number. And uh, I mean, I met my wife there. I got uh, my whole family was uh, working there. I mean, it really was a, a kind of a... a, a a little bit of a, an experience for me, and over the years that that really uh, benefited me in kind of growing through this. And as I've continued to kind of grow my journey in kind of workforce management and even beyond into workforce engagement management, um, you know, I found a real passion in kind of representing the voice of the customer, especially when it comes to contact centers. And I hold myself as a pretty strong advocate for the agent as well. You know, having been a former agent, and uh, it's not an easy job to do, and it's usually not the most high-paying job in the world either. And so, I uh, I find a lot of my uh, a lot of my energy in kind of standing up for the little guy in a lot of these cases. So it's it's really a the, you know, if you were to ask me kind of what the most rewarding part of my position is, it's it's being able to uh, represent that voice of either the you know employee at a at a large corporation or even the the customer when it comes to engaging uh, their customers and the customer experience. Gotcha, gotcha. Let's take a little bit of a step back here and, and, and tell me a little bit more about Calabrio. Listen, I know you guys are a major player in the space, but you know, just in case someone jumped on the pod and they're like, you know, who's who are these two gentlemen that are that are talking about these weird acronyms? I've never heard of them before. What's a what's a Calabrio? I have no clue. Tell us a little bit about Calabrio, what you guys do, and, and kind of how you play in the market. Yeah, so Calabrio is a, a software provider that provides workforce engagement management, and uh, you know, workforce engagement management is one of those terms that you know every time. Uh, an analyst decides to change the name, we, we have to uh, adjust. So it used to be called WFO or workforce optimization. And now it's called workforce engagement management because uh, I think that uh, some of these analysts, they, every time they change an acronym, they make more money. And so I think that's, that's usually what happens out there uh, when we talk about this. But uh, at a very base level, you know, I get asked the question a lot, what, what does your company do? And you kind of have to understand uh, what a contact center is beforehand, and you know, and the the simple example that I give to a lot of people is when you call your bank or you call your credit card company or you call customer service, and you hear the little message that says this call may be recorded for quality purposes. That's what Calabrio does. Calabrio records the call, and we provide a mechanism for the customers to go back and listen to those calls and essentially provide a report card for the agent. So uh, the other thing I'll ask is at the end of those uh, calls, you sometimes get asked if you want to fill out a survey. Um, essentially, that's 
uh, what we do a lot of do except on an internal basis. So the, the company then reviews the call, gives the agent a score. Like, did they say the customer's name three times, right? Or, you know, those really annoying things where you can tell that the, the agent on the other end of the phone was supposed to do something. You're like, I don't need you to say my name 15 times during the call, but go ahead. Um, that's generally part of that quality, quality purposes. And then beyond that, we provide analytics. So we do speech to text to uh, kind of help understand what the customers are saying during the call and reporting. And we also do WFM, workforce management, which is kind of where a lot of my passion lies. And that's the scheduling and forecasting of the agent. So knowing how many people uh, have to be uh, on the phones. So again, if you call your bank and you wait a really long time, it's more likely because they haven't created a good schedule for their agents or they haven't really done a good job recognizing how many calls they're going to get on those days. So Calabrio sets out to help organizations solve all of those particular issues through automated processes and, and really strong forecasting, uh, sorry, really, really strong software that really helps them uh, understand those things. So it's... It, it's, it's a lot easier if you work in the call center industry to know what Calabrio does, but if you don't, hopefully that gives a little bit of background to your listeners and that, so they know what, what the heck we're talking about today. Yeah, so I don't, you know, to be quite honest with you, I don't think a lot of people that are going to be listening to this podcast, I don't think, you know, they're, they're coming in here fresh. So I'm pretty sure a lot of folks are going to be understanding of, of what a Calabrio is and what they do, um, but I do appreciate the, the summary. It's always nice to make sure that we do have those T's and I's. Uh, T's crossed and I's dotted. Um, you know, you mentioned WEM, right? And we got a whole bunch of these acronyms now, right? WEM, WFO, WFM. Tell me, you know, as as someone that's in the space and, you know, as long as you've been, um, do those acronyms, do these things all play together? Do they work off of each other? Do you need one for the other? You know, kind of give us a little differentiator into sort of what all these sort of terms, not necessarily mean, but how do they play together? Yeah, so I mean, if you can make the case that uh, pretty much any contact center of decent size is going to need some form of what we provide. Um, now, granted, it's not some of it is not all need to have. Some of it is nice to have, right? For example, the the recording part of WEM is usually a need to have. Most companies. You need to be recording the interactions that come into your contact center. You need to be able to go back and listen to those in case anyone calls and says they're going to sue you because of what you said, or someone calls in with a bomb threat or, you know, the crazy things that can happen. You need to be able to go back. And that's typically what we call compliance recording. Um, but then when you start layering some of the nice to haves on top, you really get into the discussion of how it can really dramatically improve the efficiency of the contact center. It can, it can improve attrition. Um, so, you know, a good example is, you know, your customers are calling in and saying, hey, um, I, I need to place an order and all of your agents are really rude. Well, your customers will stop calling because they don't want to be treated like that. So how do we implement a system that allows us to understand what's going on? Call recording and QM allows us to kind of evaluate the agents and provide accurate coaching to their to the different layers. So, and then beyond that, you, you, what if your callers are calling and they're all waiting twenty minutes to be handled? Well, do you have a good forecast? Do you have a schedule? So, I would certainly make the argument that all of this is need to have because uh, you know, as a long time contact center person, I understand the value of how much this can be used, but it's also a lot of organizations go through a growth period where they, they, they say, you know, we, we, we're going to add on as we grow. And so smaller call centers usually start out with kind of the, just the basics and then build as they continue to grow. Gotcha. Gotcha. And you mentioned there, you know, you know, you came from the call center space, meaning, you know, you were an agent, you know, that lifestyle, you know, kind of what goes into it. Um, you know, what are some features that WEM provides that as an agent, right, you're going to get a ton of benefit from? So, you know, if you were to talk to an agent, you know, explain WEM to them in, in, in a way that would matter to them, right? Obviously, a lot of it matters. Most of it matters to everybody, but really specifically to the agent, right? What's a, what's a benefit to them or even an employee of a company that, that's, you know, kind of engulfed in WEM today and, and really sort of focusing on it since it is kind of, you know, the hot buzz term of, of of the month or, or, or kind of what you want to call it. But tell us a little bit sort of about what that looks like and, and kind of how you'd explain the, the benefits to, to an agent or just an employee internally. So as an agent, agents are a funny bunch, right? Uh, it, it, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like junior high school, 
right? Uh, where everybody feels like they should be, uh, everybody feels like they need to be treated fairly. And if you're not treated fairly, then I'm going to go tell on you. And, and it can be, it can be very, it can very, you know, be very clickish. And so from a perspective of an agent, you know, what WEM does is it really gives a sense of fairness to a lot of things, right? Um, so, for example, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many call centers I've been in and worked at where it's like, well, that person seems to get away with everything they do. Uh, okay, well, how can we make this fair? Well, we start a fair and uh, fair evaluation process of our calls so that we can start to really kind of figure out where people need need to focus and things like that. The other sense of fairness comes from their schedule. Um, from an agent's perspective, WEM has a really strong scheduling story, right? Uh, so we talk a lot at Calabrio about um, empowering agents and work-life balance and making sure that they have their thing. I mean, you and I, we don't typically have to worry too much about um, our day, right? We, we, can, we, can, we can adjust things. We can, we can take the, our lunch when we want to. We can, we can kind of move things around in our schedule, but contact center agents do not have that luxury. They get told when to sign on, when to sign off, when to eat, when to go to the bathroom. Uh, and, and <laughs> to be honest, if you want a really good read, uh, this is this is great for 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 your listeners. Um, check out the uh, Tales from Call Centers subreddit on uh, on Reddit.com r e d d i t, and you can read basically how all the agents feel about their day, right? And and there is some wild stories on there, and I reference it quite a lot when I when I'm out talking because. Um, a lot of people don't, they don't, especially management, don't give a lot of thought to what their agents are really feeling. And agents don't have really a great mechanism to provide it back. And so with WEM, we try really hard to give them um, a sense of uh, control to their day. We, we, we provide them with scheduling tools that help them kind of adjust their schedules and, and find appropriate vacation times and really try and create that work-life balance. But we also understand from a business perspective that these companies have, they have calls to answer, they have chats to handle, they have emails to reply to. And so that's always the, the, the back and forth is the balance between what the business needs and what the agent needs. And we're, we're trying to put a little bit more control in the agent's hand through our kind of workforce management solutions. And so if I were an agent, I would, I would be very, very happy to know that I can open up my smartphone and move my lunch to a slightly different time or request the rest of the day off because we're sitting here doing nothing. Those are the kind of things that from an agent's perspective that we feel are really kind of strong points about why WEM and specifically WFM could be a really strong tool for a lot of contact centers. Gotcha, gotcha. So you mentioned there, you know, a lot of key sort of attributes for agents and, and you know, you mentioned scheduling is, is a big part of it and, and making sure that, you know, people are, are taking appropriate vacations. Tell me, you know, if I'm if I'm a company or if I'm a, a, a business, you know, obviously there there's some things in there that probably generally, you know, if scheduling is good for or an agent, it's probably going to be good for the business. But tell us a little bit about sort of why that is the case, and you know what um, what key sort of you know maybe metrics a business kind of can can hone in on with a WEM. What does that do for them, and kind of you know uh, how does it play for for both? You kind of mentioned a little bit about um, you did mention. Um, sort of the balance between the two, um, mm -hmm. you know, how does a business sort of, you know, tell a little bit more about that. What do they look at? Are there any metrics that really go into that? It, or is it kind of a, you know, if it works for them, it's going to work for the business on the back end. Tell, you know, dive a little bit deeper into that if you can. Yeah. If we want to talk about metrics, I might ask you how much time, how long do we want this episode to be? Because <laughs> that's one of the, the real things about, uh, about contact centers is metrics, right? You have, you have so many metrics and that's actually one of the biggest problems. Uh, you know, there are how many calls you got, how long the calls are, handle times, hold times. Uh, you've got NPS scores, you've got customer survey scores, you've got average speed of answer, you've got service level. I mean, you, there are, and, and one of the things that, that we talk a lot about in the contact center is how it's like this really complicated and intricate system of pulleys and levers and buttons. And if you pull this one, this one goes down, but you change this one and these two go up and it's a constant movement act. What, what I've really tried to focus on lately is 
uh, yeah, those 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 kind of objective KPI are very important. But the one thing that we have to continually ask ourselves, the, the two important parts are right. Number one is customer experience. Are we giving the customer the the experience that they want? And you know, you can look at things like quality monitoring scores, you can look at survey results. You can look at net promoter scores, right? Those are really good uh, gauges of customer experience. But to balance that out, we also have to look at those key drivers of our agent experience, like attrition. Um, are we are, are are our agents quitting in droves? And if they are, we need to find out what's going on. Um, there's there's agent satisfaction scores you can do through surveys and things like that. Um, how many times are your uh, in in our system when the agent receives an evaluation of their call, they can challenge that. How many challenges are happening? Right, that's a decent indicator of that. So, we've got tons of objective measurements that we could tap into in a contact center, and that's actually one of the biggest problems. Is there's too much? There's mm-hmm. just so much data out there, and how do we wrap our arms around it? One of the things Calabrio provides is a reporting and BI tool that helps try and wrap around the the information too. But I am, as I said, a strong proponent of the agent. And to me, agent, agent satisfaction is a real key driver in a lot of this. And if your agents are happy, your customers are happy. If your customers are happy, you make profit. And that's a pretty tried and true, you know, axiom of customer service. And uh, that's what we're really trying to strive for is how to, how to make that, that agent experience a very positive one. If you have a good schedule, you're usually going to be pretty happy. Yeah, it kind of goes back to that old uh, that old saying, right? Happy wife, happy life, happy agent, happy culture, right? Happy profits, et cetera. So plays hand and, in hand. And what's really scary is, is that it's taken us a long, long time to figure that out. When I first started working in call centers, it was, I mean, my first schedule in a call center was 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. with Tuesdays and Thursdays off, right? Try working that schedule as like an 18-year-old uh, in college and, and trying to manage a social life. And, you know, thank God I didn't have kids at the time because I would have gone insane. But that's, that's basic. And it was like, well, you'll be on that schedule for the first eight months and then we'll see what's available. And Back then, I was like, sweet, I'm making $11 an hour, high five, I am in. I mean, I was rolling, you know, single, single guy running around. And, uh, the, and, but, but it's taken us a really long time to stop and say, oh my gosh, wh- what, if, what if our employees were really happy with this job? And what if we had really long tenured agents that really can answer everything off the top of our head and our customers are just super satisfied with it? We've got a lot of technology wrapped around that too. So it's really the, the change in uh, approach has really benefited uh, the, the customer experience issue. And then we had this stupid pandemic that kind of messed everything up. And now we've got to kind of start back from square run and figure out how to make our agents happy again. And, you know, that's always a big part of the conversation today. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy that you touched on it. You provided a very easy segue for me. I do oh, appreciate nice. that. <laughs> uh, you mentioned you mentioned the pandemic, right? And I don't want to really focus on just the pandemic. I, I kind of want I wanted your insight on sort of the space itself, right? We've moved to a much heavier remote workforce, right? I think that's probably a fair statement to make. Today, we're more remote as as you know an industry than than ever. How has that sort of changed, not just WEM, but all the other ones that we kind of talked about as well, right, WFO um, and WFM as well. How has that kind of changed? Has it accelerated the process? Has it put us behind a little bit? You know, where do you see the technology today and sort of kind of how it all plays together today in, in today's time? Tell us a little bit sort of your insights on that. Yeah, so there's been kind of two key drivers here in my mind. Number one, the absolute biggest story of the pandemic was the cloud. And, you know, pre-pandemic, cloud was kind of one of those things that kind of forward-facing organizations said, ah, yeah, we, we should probably be doing this. And, I mean, okay, this is, the, again, try to make this a little more interesting for, for your listeners. I remember back in the day of, you know, everything was on-prem, the phone system, everything. And we, uh, as a call center, we, had, we, we did drills about what would happen if there was an emergency. And we had to, like, it was 
pick up your headset and we had to walk to the, the other building and we had to connect in and there were temporary workstations set up and it was all very much like if something happened to our main building, how do we still you know keep business continuity going over here? And the pandemic really proved that the companies that were thinking about the cloud early benefited greatly because they just moved, right? We had, we had one customer that was like, I asked them, how, how much, how big of a problem was this? And they said, like, we didn't even notice. People just took their headsets and went home. I was like, oh, okay, nice. But we had other customers that were doing really crazy things like forwarding their phone calls to agents' personal cell phones, right? <laughs> and I mean, can you imagine being an agent? And you're like, yeah, well, now I have to use my cell phone, right? And, and, and the cloud really uh, proved that that was a, that was a big thing. Um, on the other on the other side of it, the the what we kind of just talked about, the work from home movement really it stressed the importance of of good scheduling and flexibility in scheduling, especially for agents. About you know now not only are we having people work from home, but now people are dodging second graders at the same time, right? And you, can you I mean. Thankfully, my children were old enough and grown that I didn't have to deal with this during the pandemic. And I don't know if you had to deal with this or not, too. But the the ability for agents to say, can I please adjust my lunch? Can I please take the rest of the day off because my kids are just losing their mind? And being able to do that without with in an automated fashion has really kind of proven it. So we look at two big shifts. We looked at the shift to the cloud. That was a big thing. And then the second shift was just flexibility in the, from the agent's perspective and how they managed it. So the pandemic crammed about five years of growth into about you know 18 months. Wow. And it's going to end up being pretty good in the long run for a lot of people. And, and I'm kind of glad we did because it was one of those things that we kept on talking about and talking about mm -hmm. and talking about. And then it actually happened. And we were like, see, see, we, we told you, we told you this was going to happen. And, and a lot of people said, yeah, you're right. It, it happened. And we didn't want it to happen in that way. But uh, it was kind of nice to see that the technology was embraced. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, we kind of over an in inflow, right, we kind of dealt with the same sort of obstacles, right? We have tons of customers that are on-prem with remote, remote being such a big part of the industry today. Um, you know, we're looking at different strategies that our customers, either they didn't have one at all, or maybe it wasn't the greatest strategy to begin with. And it kind of, you know, your hair is on fire. There's tons of things going on. You got to find solutions that probably would have taken maybe a year or so to, to really sort of excavate and, and, and dive into and you're making decisions in, in a few months because you know you got to get your remote workforce out there so we definitely understand that sort of craziness that we've all encountered in the space um, as far as sort of kind of you know um, really thinking about sort of the organizations themselves and where they're at today um, what would you say to the, the the companies or the businesses that maybe they haven't made that that change and maybe they were able to get by with like you said you know forwarding calls to their agent cell phones right and maybe they got by by the skin of their teeth you know what would you say to them you know we got maybe they got through the worst parts of the pandemic and, and they're alive again today you know um, what, what would your advice be to those organizations or maybe the ones that don't even have a plan to begin with maybe they just put everything on hold and, and went back to business as usual there's two ways I can approach this. I could approach this as being very nice and say, <laughs> uh, don't worry, guys. You'll always have some sort of on-prem option that you can tap into. Uh, and, you know, that will, uh, and there will be companies out there. But I have two words for those companies. And actually, it's one, two word, words combined into one. And that would be BlackBerry. Um, think, about, think about the number of people that would probably still love to use a BlackBerry today. Um, but the problem is not that BlackBerry was not willing to let you do it. The problem is, is that the market completely left that design behind. And that's what's going to happen is that as, you know, the cloud's not going away, it's ramping up at an incredible pace. Uh, and what, what you're going to see happen is that eventually the, the, the big players in the market are going to stop supporting on-prem deployments. They're, they're, they're going to realize that there's, it doesn't do them any good to continue to sink R&D dollars into it. And 
you know, there's always going to be a need for on-prem. I mean, you've got government institutions, you've got you've got things that you know really need that hardened security and and do can't put things in the cloud. We also have regulations that are making uh, cloud deployments a little bit wild, right? You've got GDRP, you've got you know the you know the, the Patriot Act throws a lot of things into question here in the U.S. But as we grow the options are going to be more and more limited as to what you can do. So, you know, you can you can look at it like we'll be able to survive. There will always be a provider out there that's going to give us an on-prem option, but your options are going to get thinner and thinner to the point where there's going to be, it's, you know, I'm sure you could go out today and probably hack together a BlackBerry and, and make it work, but it's not going to work on 5G. Uh, you can't download any apps for it. You can't. Right. You can use it as a phone and maybe answer some emails on it, and that's because you really like that form factor. Or you can just adapt to the way technology is driving the market and look into the cloud. Gotcha. I love that comparison. Uh, as soon as you said BlackBerry, I just had this aha moment in my head. Like <laughs> that makes so much sense. Yes, yep. absolutely. Um, tell me a little bit yeah, about. And, and I had a conversation with my brother-in-law literally like two weeks ago, and he was like, "Oh, I loved my BlackBerry so much," and. But he still uses he uses an iPhone because yeah. there's just you can't get them anymore. Right. It, 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 there's almost like a, a um, there's almost like an element of logic that comes into play, right? Like, yeah, you know, you may love or may, maybe you like right using one uh, avenue, which is the BlackBerry. But like everyone else is sort of in this circle of well, we're kind of ahead of that right now, and and you're kind of behind at the moment. Um, I want to know a little bit more about the Calabrio end of this, as far as you know, what an ideal sort of customer or prospect or if I'm a company out there and I'm like, I don't know, is Calabria right for me? Maybe I'm too small or, you know, maybe we don't have enough going on for a Calabria to help me. What does that look like on your guys' end as far as prospects and as far as, you know, potential customers? What do you guys like to see? Who can you help? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, we, you know, the, the, the joke answer is we want uh, 100,000 seats uh, with a blank check and ready to go, right? That's uh, and, and has <laughs> we all to do, today. Dave. We all do. <laughs> yeah, we we all want that. Uh, but so uh, any any organization that considers themselves to be a contact center, you know, I get the question a lot, like, what's too small? Is there anything that's too small? And and to be honest, uh, no, because it's all about the 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 organization. So even if you only had ten agents and you're open from eight to noon every day, you still probably need to record your calls um, at a minimum, right? And that's not to say you have to use Calabrio to do that. A lot of times the, the phone provider is going to give you some sort of option to record your calls. But what I see so often happen is that you think you're a call center, a, a small call center until you're not. Right. And and then it's two years past when you should have made these types of investments. So my my advice is is that if you think you're too small now and you're you're you have any plans on growing, now should be the time to start to look into WEM options. And you don't it's not an all or nothing solution either. You can buy it in pieces and you can you can move towards a goal. But you know, the the answer you're probably looking for is about fifty seats. Or 50 agents, right? Okay. That's usually kind of the tipping point. But there are other mitigating factors. Like if you if you you if you have a thousand seats, but you only answer one skill and one language, eh, you could you can get away with using Excel to do a lot of the things that you want to do. Um, uh, but if you have 30 seats, but you have five languages and five different and ten different skills, and you want to do chats and emails as well. The, you really should be looking into a workforce engagement platform. So, um, but the nice, solid, easy answer is about 50 seats. That's usually when the the manual processes get to be too much. You know, you're building you're building your QM forms in Excel. You're you're trying to schedule people in Excel. And I mean, think about just your organization uh, and how hard it would be for you to build a schedule for just the people that work with you in Excel. It would it would drive you crazy, Absolutely. and that's what we do is we we help automate a lot of those processes so that you can get to the business of your your organization as opposed to the scheduling and the the day to day uh, crap that goes in with that. I love it, absolutely love it. Um, I'm going to get you out of here, Dave, on on a, on a little bit of a lighter note. I want to scale back a little bit. Uh, before you became WFM evangelist, right? Before you got that sacred title, um, what you know? Tell me about sort of. 
were you always in the space? Was there any times in your career where, you know, maybe you thought, ah, maybe I want to go try something different? You know, any other passions that sort of lay with you, you know, apart from helping folks uh, on the connectivity side? What does that look like on your end? Well, it's funny because you can. Uh, the answer to your question is pretty obvious on my screen here. If you if you have the ability to see me visually, uh, I spent uh, 15 years in a rock band trying to make it. You know, like legitimately packing myself into a small van with uh, three other you know teenage men, so to speak, and uh, you know touring around the uh, the South. I live in Texas, and so you know Oklahoma, Louisiana, and driving around and. Um, tried really hard to, you know, be a bass player. We wanted to be the Foo Fighters so bad. We, we couldn't oh, even man. tell you. Uh, Who doesn't? And, Who uh, doesn't? And what's actually really interesting is that uh, that experience it actually is what makes me enjoy my job today is, you know, being on stage and, and speaking to people and trying to be entertaining and not boring at the same time. It goes, it, it plays a lot of that. And of course, like what happens to most people, family happens right. and you know, you get married and you have kids and, and being in a rock band isn't the most realistic goal anymore. But, uh, <laughs> th there was that time, but during that time, I was very fortunate that I had an employer at the time that was very flexible with me and it was a call center. And, you know, I just never, I never questioned the, the, the calling. I never questioned the passion that I had for, and the reason I fell in love with workforce management was because it was the rare combination of like being really, really nerdy. There's a lot of math and a lot of like very technical, you know, understanding how things work, but also dealing with human beings and people. And it was like, you know, it sounds, it sounds kind of corny, but I loved the idea of approving a vacation day for people. I loved yeah. the idea of hearing like, hey, I'm going on a cruise next month and I need this time off and, and being able to do that for people and also kind of tap into my love of, uh, of, of kind of the, the breaking things apart and taking off the cover and understanding how things work. So yeah, it's, it's just kind of always been, I'm, I'm, I, I, the the funniest story that I have about that, I'm actually second generation workforce management. My dad was the WFM guy in the first call center that I worked at. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, it's not like he sat me on his lap and said, son, one day this is how it will be. But, uh, you know, be, but, you know, that's a lot of that is what instilled a lot of that passion is getting seeing what he did and, and, and working through that. And, you know, I'm trying to live my legacy. And, you know, it's funny. I may even pass that along to one of my kids one day. But, uh, right. you know, they, they, they have no idea what I do for a living. So <laughs> not yet. Not yet. They will. They have to, especially maybe after this podcast. Right. They'll catch yeah, you on exactly. there. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I got to ask. I have to ask just because I feel like if I was listening to the podcast, the first thing in my mind would be like, man, what was the name of his band? So uh, we, were, we were called Frolic, okay, and uh, it, it is available on Apple Music and Spotify, but you have to be careful, right? There's actually like three different Frolics out there, mm -hmm. and so if you, hear a, uh, if you hear a Frolic that's like guitar alternative rock, that's us. If you hear okay. a Frolic that's like ethereal, mystic, uh, like mist in the woods stuff, that's not us, right? And okay. so you, you know, you'll, you'll know it by the aggressive guitars. Uh, that's, that's, that's the frolic you, sh you should be listening to. Gotcha. So for those listening, if you're, looking at, if you're looking for frolic, make sure the guitar is something that you hear before you continue listening. That's right. <laughs> Perfect. Dave, I want to thank you again, my friend, so much for, for taking the time to, to join us today. I think we got a, a ton of good stuff out of you. I'm, I'm really excited to sort of see sort of how this you know, relationship continues between uh, collaborators and, and, and flow and honestly I'm excited to see what the future holds for you guys as well I think with where the industry is going I think you guys are can continue to be a big player um, and uh, you know I, I don't know if there's anything that you want to leave us with um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor here for the next 20 30 seconds or so for for your send-off my friend no I, I really appreciate the time and, and let me let me come on and, and spew nonsense for for 25 minutes here but uh, it's been been great and you know I would say that uh, if you're out there and you're in the contact center space and you have questions uh you know 
let me know. I, I, I'll talk, as you can tell, I, I'll, I'll talk this to the ends of the earth. No pressure. You're not going to get a sales pitch from me. You're going to have somebody talk to you. And you know what? It may lead to, yeah, Calabria makes a lot of sense to you. But if not, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me through many different other channels. So uh, so please just uh, give me a shout out. I, I, even if you just want to chat about some kind of call center thing, let's talk. So I'm always looking for a new connection and somebody to talk to about it. I love it. Thanks so much again, Dave. For those that are still listening, I want to thank you guys for listening. You can find us on wherever you find your podcast today. We're on iHeartRadio. We're on the Apple um, platforms as well, Spotify. Um, so I'll leave you guys with that. I hope everyone has a good uh, rest of their day and a great week, and uh, we'll speak to everyone soon. Thanks for listening.